The devil's hands have been busy, and we've been fighting this energy for a very long time. We've had our temple sieged, the 33 stair spinal cord climbed, our innermost sanctuary, the pineal gland, coated with acid. Sometimes we've been working around the clock without quit. Eon after eon, the same wars, the same battles, fought in the same way. But we humans have a strength that cannot be measured. This is Turtle on the News with Tracy Kennedy. If you are listening to this, you are the resistance. Join me from 12 to 2 Eastern Standard Time, Tuesday and Thursdays on Wolf Spirit Radio and Revolution Radio. Totally human-supported radio. Good morning, everyone. I hope you found today light and airy when you woke up and that you didn't feel heavy and tired and frustrated. We've been fighting the exact same thing. The right white snake the black snake, the red snake, all spiraled around us. And our choices are between death by exile or death by gun. We ask this same question, why is life this way? And there is one we don't like to face. But when we awaken late at night, alone in our thoughts, with no distractions of daily life to fill that void, we come face to face with our actual dilemma. And it is terrible silence. In those moments of cold clarity, the bleakness and futility of our existence in cosmic terms rises up to confront us as it confronted all humanity throughout millennia. Looking back at history, we see that to escape this monstrous dark night of the soul, human beings will accept almost any answer, any religious belief, any philosophy that may be offered, because the cold, abysmal silence that follows the question must be filled at any cost. That sad fact is there are plenty of people willing to try to convince us that they have the answer to all of our questions. These blind, leading the blind, can be found in the pulpits of every church, across every land, in the seminars, in the lecture circuits. But these answers generally consist of confusing discernment of reality with personal opinion which results in judgment upon reality by refusing to acknowledge what really is and those parts of reality that are not acknowledged have a way of biting us. Those who not, do not learn from the past are doomed to repeat it. At this moment, everyone and his brother is looking for a King Arthur a holy grail, waiting for the aliens to land on the White House lawn so they can kick the tires out of the UFO catalog. I've read hundreds of books on these subjects, many recent. All who claim to have discovered that the two subjects overlap that the Holy Grail is really a bloodline and that this bloodline of these special people are the offspring of alien beings, alternatively good guys or bad guys, depending on the opinion of the writer or the speaker. These conclusions of this current raft of researchers point to aliens from Mars or some distant place that have come to earth in the distant planets past and they are the real gods, the current fad of focus on the pyramids. Pyramids, prism, prison, and the Sphinx have all led them to conclude that the root of all this, all these great mysteries 
of Egypt that the Egyptian gods were the original and the true gods. They are advanced and superior beings from the stars, Mars, Jupiter, Atlantis. They originally had a great civilization that was destroyed. They came to Earth and gave great impetus for information of all of our early civilizations. The stories then sort of go back and forth between these gods being truly physical as humans are, or being naders or naeus, or principles, as purely ethereal beings who occasionally designed to manifest on earth. If I had only heard that story once, I would give it up. But I've heard it in every culture, in every land, in every time on this earth. I want to ask you something and I want you to really take it seriously today and tell me what you think about this because this is going to be an open-ended discussion before we move further. I really want you guys to get this and I know I'm not talking to dummies here so please listen and I'm going to give you the number because I do want callers today. The number is 702-879-4770. Here's my question. Oh, yes, and people listening on Revolution Radio, um, feel free to call in the studio way. If Atlantis was a perfect society, why is it not here? If Lemuria was the perfect place of advanced cultural, moral, spiritual beliefs. Why is it not here? If the Palladians have a perfect society, why are they not home? See where I'm going? Why are we given the exact same story? Not kind of the same story, but the exact story. Abraham and Sarah, Brahma and Saravita, thousands of years before each other, way across time and space. Why is it the same story? Are these aliens, these gods, these Anunnaki's, so without thought that they repeat the exact same stories? with the exact same symbols all the time? Have they nothing new to offer? Gnosticism, Christianity, Judaism if you want to call that a religion, although it's almost word for word Indian from India. And Christianity, again a knockoff from that, and you know, the Muslim faith, I'm sorry, is exactly the same. The stories start off the same. Wars and decadence on the planet, fireballs in the sky, return of the dragons, and then this God comes in and gives us all the answers. And then comes the sacrifice and the bloodletting and us working for them. Of course, mythology, right? Silly, stupid things that we used to make up to amuse ourselves in the past. Why is it very rich men cut the ribbon after a building's made? Did they make that building? So they're cutting the cord on something we created with our own hands. I hear all these people who said they are challenging or channeling their ancient lives where they used to be. Of course, they're all gods and goddesses and priests and priestesses. And, uh, da -da 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 -da. If your life was so good, why is your butt back here now? Why? When I've been talking to people in the last couple of days, and I've decided to go over this before I go on. 
many people are feeling a stress right now. It's like they're waiting for something. Or they feel that they have been so changed recently that they can't even speak to the people they used to speak to. They can't relate. They no longer are able to deal with these things, with this repeating agenda that we're going through. And it's repeating, of course. I mean, it's not re repeating kind of. It's repeating exactly. Exactly. They don't even make up new symbols. If you've been listening to me for a while, and when I put up all the pictures for the matrix code, all through these societies, as far back as we get, have the exact same symbols. We have the white snake. We have the black snake. We have the red snake. We have the beings with wings from up above. We have the energy beings from down below, up or below. We have the summer people or the Sumerians. That just means summer kingdom or perfected God. We have the Aryans or the air or the winged people who worship the sun and they're above. We have the big owl-eyed beings that have been everywhere all over the planet in very similar kind of space like looking outfits with the owl. We have Bohemian Grove with the owl eyes. We have people seeing aliens, the little greys, with great big owl eyes. And of course, one of the reasons that's used is the light beings, the Aryans, don't like the owl eyes because it is a night creature. Still flies, but it is the wrong kind of flying thing. We have the angels and the demons in a constant battle for our soul here. We have been fighting the exact same thing in the exact same way or I wouldn't be here talking about it. No wonder you're frustrated. I can tell you stories repeatedly. And I do, of course. I love reading your stories. But they're the same story. We look at the movies and they're the same movie. How many times do they have to make a zombie movie before we get it? How many different vampire movies till we get that? How many different, the good aliens, the bad aliens, the angels, the Elvisatorians, the C's, the B's, the WSR, you know, whatever. E's. <laughs> if they were okay, they would be home. They don't give a flying, you know the word I'm thinking of, about us, unless they're using us. Why do they come in crafts? Because we can go through all through history, like we have, and they are in ships. They are riding in a vehicle. They are here on cherubim. They are now in UFOs. They're the same guys. They're not kind of the same guys. They are the exact same guys. Exactly the same. They come here and all you have to do is let them possess you. Work for them. Feed them. These non-corporeal, these what? Inorganic beings. Because all the stories are the exact same. They are incarnate or inorganic. They come here and learn something about us. They remember what it was like to be corporeal, to be organic, to kiss and to hug and all those wonderful things that we should be doing with each other instead of fighting each other over ridiculousness. Then they look to the daughters of Eve and find her beautiful. They look to the beings of humanity and find us beautiful. What is beauty? Beauty 
in this way has nothing to do with love. They didn't, there is nowhere ever written saying that they looked at us and they fell in love. Not once. They didn't love us. They saw something about us that they coveted. Covet. Covenant. And then a deal was made. Some people would grow strong if they let themselves be take to, taken over by these friggin' things. And we signed this covenant. One way or another, they always get some of us to sign it over and over and over again. Or we would not be here living in this world fighting the exact same battle still. These opposing parties either declare the serpent race to be representative of some benevolent, scaly gang of... I'm trying to not to cuss. Um, civilizers. Because civilization and... Colonizers have always done well for the people who they are colonizing. They always have humanity's best interests at heart. This group promotes or the reptilian bloodline of Christ or proposes that a descendant of this line is going to come along, a new Christ, a new world order, who will lead us all to true enlightenment if we prepare ourselves according to any number of bizarre ideas and proposals. Some claim to be a hyperdimensional race, some physical like us, some not. Various levels of physicality, but they look at us and find us beautiful. Other groups, of course, are supposed to be just demonic, just ethereal, who can descend into a person or a human being, a host, and this being becomes a shape-shifter and temporarily goes back and forth to reptilians, whether this is the Queen of England or any number of leaders. Enough of these things are abundant in lunacy and bizarre beyond reckoning. A number of variations on this theme, of course, with just every few preferred belief, A to Z, represented. In all cases, the chief feature of said designation focused on something or a group of physical human beings as conspirators or guardians whether you call them masons or rosicrucians or templars or illuminatis or kings and queens you take your pick it's that or some <clears throat> strict ethereal conception of the conspirators I mean guardians. First case, humanity is divided into good guys, bad guys. Second case, people are encouraged to place their faith in the ethereal good guys in order to be saved from the ethereal bad guys. At the end of it all, there is the strangest thing I have ever observed. Just as Hitler was obsessed with the discovery of some material object that would give him total and complete power over the world, over the gods. So do these different groups have similar objectives in mind. Discover the grail or the ark. These things ride in an ark of some kind or anagram what we use because we're emulating this crap still, a car anagram for an ark. It's nothing different. If it rides in a ship, it is not a god. Period. If it needs a vehicle or a vessel to travel in, it is not a god. If it is coming to ask you to worship it, to pray to it, to become prey, 
because it is a predator. It is not God. It is, if it is telling you that there is an elite group of people that were given favor by some alien race or some ancient group of people who were so different than us to make them separate, that is not God. That civilization is gone for a reason. We are here right now because of everything that has happened before. Every being that walks, crawls, flies. Not just here on this earth, but in the cosmos, we are stardust, as the song goes. I've read you thousands of articles saying that there is DNA and RNA falling in the rain from outer space, falling to the ground from meteors and asteroids. We are constantly seeded by the energies of the sun. That is proven, it is not myth, that when it bursts, it sends a specific energy that frequency that causes a vibration in the Earth's core and causes vibration in every single cell, which is our internal sun in our body. And there are billions of suns, and they are all affecting us. There are who knows how many planets. They, too, are affecting us. So to think there's some special group of beings out there that are going to come to you and save you will never happen. There will be no alchemist that will receive a special gift from God or a present from some ethereal being that is better than you and knows more than you and will save you from this earth. You cannot be saved from here. We do not need to be saved. We cannot leave our brothers and sisters behind. If we are to learn, we must go and rescue our brothers and sisters. All of them. We worry about color still, and it's the most ridiculous concept I've ever even heard of. You know, we could win an award for stupidity sometimes. I really believe that. We could win the award for stupid. Of course, it's because we've bought into their myth. We've heard the same story over and over again, but you think from one religion it is a different story because they use a different combination of JC. No wonder we're frustrated. No wonder we're sick of it. If somebody worships the same religion, we can fight because they worship that religion in a wrong way. Think of how many beings have come here and possessed us that we fight like cat and dogs over this ridiculous stuff. We run. We still kill for beings that are what to us? What are they? We have talked about the Khazars who call themselves the Jews. I want to say one thing to you. They are not an ethnic group. They are a religion. Anyone can sign up for it. Anyone. That's the difference between an ethnic group and a religion. And as for ethnic groups, let's talk about that too. There is not one, just one, type of DNA on the Great Turtle Island, North America. Maybe 10 years ago, we were told that they were all, they all walked over from Siberia and they walked all the way from up north, down south. I'm going to tell you a couple secrets here. And this is scientific fact. You can look it up. The Blackfoot are genetically linked to the ancient Germans. 
and the Mongolians, closer to um, Tibetan, actually. So does that make sense for a story that they all came over from the land bridge? Of course, you know, Mongolians had a very long, um, huge amount of land that they went over, of course, you could say that. But the first Japanese also have this ancient Tibetan-Mongolian mix. There are many different cultures here many different kinds of humans and we can we can argue about you know different manifestations of this because when they talk about evolution and of course the guy who spoke about it first was working for the elites we've gone into this he was an x-man he you know was putting forth a certain amount of things that you know the fish developed and we are we evolved from the fish well, it's kind of true, but not in the way he said it, and he knew that. We carry the genetic markers for everything on this planet. That means anything, anything here can do, we can do. Period. Think I'm wrong? Show me how I'm wrong. There is a genetic marker in one beautiful South American tribe that of course are down to two people because it was discovered and they were colonized to death there's only two people left that have an ancient DNA link from Africa and the people that first settled on Australia did they walk from Africa to Australia from Australia to South America, they did not. Actually, their cave drawings are exactly the same, too. What they did was get on a ship or a boat and come over here. They, too, call themselves, uh, well, they didn't call themselves, the scientists said they're some archaic human. When I've been doing the studies for DNA, because we have to go into the Jewish thing next, what we find here is a manipulation of words and terms. There were many different kinds of upright, upright walking humans. I'm not going to call them humanoid. I'm not going to use that word archaic because guess what's in it? Arc. They're telling us something. Just like the beings from outer space arrived in an arc or a ship where they sailed an arc. Archaic. Beautiful young boy that was found. His um, body is officially one million years old. They've found out that he was um, 12 years old, a little younger. He was six foot tall at 12. He was African. There was a small clan that they found several bones like that, where all the people, the other beings around him were relatively small, but they were not monkeys. For a while, maybe his people had more food. Our bodies change because they adapt. We carry all the DNA because we've adapted from things. We change and adapt. We do not evolve and things do not get destroyed. There were many different kinds of beings on this planet. There still are multiple ones. Sometimes they're bigger. Sometimes they're smaller. Sometimes in one generation. That's why we have those hobbit people whose DNA, by the way, is found on um, Indonesia, one of the islands, and all the way to Hawaii. Of course, they walked, too. I guess everyone walked. No one could build a friggin' ship, but even though those people still build ships that could sail back and forth, of course, you know, people were stupid. Why is it always that people were stupid? We hear that over and over again. Well, they don't say stupid, but they might as well. 
that, you know, their brains weren't so big and they didn't know much. We look at the DNA that we are seeing from Neanderthals. I, too, were told that they were barbaric, bloodthirsty. You know, their brain doesn't say that. Their brain, which is larger than ours, say that these beings, and we're not just talking about their bone, we're talking about the shape of the brain. They didn't have um, as much frontal lobes as we do, which means that they didn't spend a lot of their time judging and analyzing. But the back part of the brains, the part that we still use to dream, we still use to create, we still use to sing, and several of their Several of their hookups that were a little different between the brain and the throat. So that not only did they think and create, that they all had perfect pitch. That they were mystical and magical. That they were beautiful beings. And now it's starting to creep out that they had cities. Some of them with over 100,000 people in a time where that was a big deal. We have some of their DNA too. Everyone who has relatives on, um, in Europe has their DNA. It's probably where we learned our creativity, our beauty, our rituals, our knowing that there's someplace else to go because it's Neanderthal, um, the oldest ceremonies of um, and celebrations of burials were them, not us. Our brain so big, we've been given a gift by every being that has ever been here. And I think some of the reasons why we all feel so frustrated is on a basic level, we know this. We know that we've been lied to about everything. You know, if it was just one thing, I wouldn't mind. If it was just one thing, I would not mind at all. But it's everything. It's the exact same thing. It's the exact same lies being thrown in her face that one religion is better than another, one people is better than another, one group of individuals who we've allowed to rule us are better than us and know more than us. No, he was not a sexy X-Men. He was ugly. Like all of the people who call them elites are, they look like reptiles. As they age, they just kind of suck into themselves and all the moisture is ripped out of them. That's what they look like. These beings who are so much better than us are ugly, stupid, barbaric. And speaking of bar, Barack, we are given the exact same choices all the time. Even Barack can be a blessing or a curse by the words they show us. When we look outside and see the actions on our planet physically, mentally, emotionally, know that this is what's happening in our body. February 15th, this month. There was a hazing death of a young man whose name was very, well, let me go, let me go through this slowly. A Barack freshman was declared a homicide. Young age of man supposedly going to school for a higher education in the universe, university. Let me take a little deeper look at this event so that we can see what is being said in the spiritual world because all of this relates to that. Everything. I want us to remember how this event connects with all the previous events I've shown you 
regarding the Pope's releasing of the birds, reference to Noah's Ark, coming destruction of fallen angels in Nephilim, the recurring, the, the super beings, the ubermensch, these winged beings, always thrown in our faces like they are better, but they never said they loved us. They looked on us and coveted. They saw something they wanted. Love is never mentioned. And of course, these things played out right in front of our faces with the Grammys, like I've said, and their pretty little rainbowing and the two-by-two gay people walking down. This Super Bowl, past Super Bowls, all the Super Bowl performances and Super Bowl commercials are always telling us the exact same thing because they need to reinforce the exact same story. Why? Reinvent the real. All the current events, coming events, events from the not-too-distant past are telling us the exact same story. In the exact same way, too. Now, the young man's name was Michael Deng, D-E-N-G. He attended Barash, I think you'd say it, B-A-R-U-C-H College. He was killed in a hazing ritual in the Pocono Mountains. This place supposedly people go to for love. For the bonding ritual, I guess. The sexual part of it. Of course, there is a lovely little pentagram shape, just like the Pentagon for the university. No big surprise there. This use of the Pentagon, the Pentangle, are all related to the 9-11 attacks. Again, pentagram, Pentagon sent on fire, still throwing the exact same symbols in her face all the time. Do you get it? Do you get it? Do you get it? And let's just take a look at his name so we can get a better understanding of the symbolism behind his murder. Because that's what it is. Michael Dieng Pocono. Hazing ritual. So Michael means who is like God? Dieng. Red. Socialist, revolutionary, which is also a symbol for bloodshed or murder and Satan. That's why it's used so much in negative signs, like a big red stop sign. It's supposed to pull at your heart and make you stop. Pocono, sacred heart, blessed, set apart leader. So yes, I take these words apart because we're getting the same rituals thrown in our faces again again and again and again. If they were different even a little bit, I'd uh, ignore it. But they're the same. Now, Barack's mentor, socialist revolu revolutionary Saul Alinsky, wrote about Lucifer and called him the first radical. Barack Obama's mentor. Of course, he used a lot of red and black and white, which is the three snakes. So, the message reads by the young man's name, who is like God, the red, socialist, revolutionary, Satan, and a sacred head who is blessed and set apart. Sacred head, so he has a crown on it. As we've said, you know, the some of the uh, pictures of of Satan, if you want to still use that word. He's wearing some sort of crown because he is Saturn. And let's look at the name alone, Barush. Barush? Barush is Hebrew. Means to bless or to curse, to endure with power and success. So it could be either one. So Barak still resonates with that. It's also connected with the Hebrew word Barak, which means lightning, and to cast forth or to send out. Not really fall. I've been asked that a lot. Not, not that I can see. So remember, 
when we look at the old books, well, actually, I'll take a, a passage from the Bible. And I saw Satan fall like lightning from the heaven. That's translated in Hebrew exactly as Barak O Bama. That's how it's pronounced. When we've listened to some of rap artists, too, who are no longer writing their own songs, they're being told what to um, say. There's an old um, Jay-Z called Hava. Had an album called The Blueprint. Whether or not this is, well, actually, The Blueprint, The Gift or The Curse, that was what it was called, the album. Interestingly enough, blueprint means original, archetype, Barak, again, gift or curse, Barak, lightning which fell from heaven. They're repeating these things over and over and over again just to keep it in our mind, remind us to remember. Jay-Z is actually saying, Hova, God, the original archetype is Barak. Jay-Z and Beyonce have both made it pretty clear their support for Barack, as many activists have, thinking they were doing things. I remember I showed you the 2013 Super Bowl for performance. We talked about that before. Destiny's Child, depicting them as Charlie's angels, except they're standing in the fire. Charles means warrior. Therefore, they're depicted as warrior angels from hell. And that's how they were dressed. And they sang about a child of destiny. As they're wearing black, standing in the fire, letting little girls scream and want to be like them. This whole mindset that we're being taught here. Our little children, with, you know, great help from Disney, of course, are being taught to become this thing. Be the channel for these beings, these entities. I showed you a while ago the book about Obama called Obama Mania. Well, it kind of means Destiny's Child, too. February 3rd, last year, of course, Beyonce's performance carried a message of a wedding or a covenant by hand signals made. Now, you know the ring on it symbol, you know, where everybody can it puts up puts up their hand facing you and points to that finger. Actually it's a symbol. That's a hand sign for that. Michelle Obama actually appeared on Jimmy Fallon and does the ring covenant dance. This is a covenant. This is what that symbol means. You put your hand palm facing in and you know she was just doing it all the single ladies all the single ladies make the covenant make the sign the hand side call in the aliens open yourself to them that's what it means interestingly enough Barack himself did the exact same dance three months before Beyonce performed it at Super Bowl or his wife performed it on Jimmy Fallon a little known clip so Brock standing there doing a little dance and making the little ring on it simple again hand and then you do the wave so that you show the palm to the back of the hand or you do it sideways very interestingly very next month after Beyonce's Super Bowl performance Brock entered Israel six days before Passover riding a donkey imitating Jesus Christ's triumphal entrance to Jerusalem. Well, if we can believe any of those stories, his exit from there was not so cool. Although we've talked about these, the same story being shown, but um, the priest, the ubermensch, the Savior God, never ends well. Hmm. The name of his official visit, A Covenant of Peoples, also a ref reference to um, Daniel, so Christianity. 
And one last thing about Michael Dean's death. He received a head wound. He was killed during a hazing ritual for his fraternity, Phi Delta Psi. Do you guys know what that is? It looks like a, well, let me, Pi is 3.14. Genesis 3.14 is the verse in which God cursed Satan. So remember, Barak means blessed or cursed. We are just being shown this now with all the things. And, of course, I'm going to keep going with this. I want you to know that it's the exact same things we're going up. Delta, which is a pyramid, which is the closed A, which should be an open A sign, basically, which would mean the joining of male and female. At the top, you look at it as three points, so the top would be the child, male and female. Closing it, the pyramid, is supposed to be our pineal gland, our energies contained with both male and female, not either, not or. But a pyramid is also a prison, prism and prison. So delta, of course, we have phi, delta, delta the pyramid, Hebrew letter dalet, represents a door, an access point, or an entrance. See where I'm going with this? And that's what the pyramids, I think, are. That's what our bodies are. Do you remember I talked about Pink Floyd's The Dark Side of the Moon album, complete with pyramid and prism and uh, nice little rainbow colors? So it represents a possession. Men acting as a doorway for the spiritual world to enter the physical world. And I think that's what we're all feeling right now. Psi, the Algiz rune, basically, is um, symbolic of the elk god. Yeah, the salt runes. No, I, I don't think so. Or the stag god, called Cernimus. Or Cernimus, so like Cern, basically. Psi is Cern. The horn god, the serpent god of nature and fertility serpent god so also the beast king so the ruler of the planet ruling the beast I had a question too I wanted to answer before I go on and we'll talk about this and feel free to call in guys because I want to hear how you're feeling right now and if you're sick of us uh, being thrown the exact same conversation now, I wanted to tread lightly on this. It's like I know people have their beliefs, but I decided not to. The Shepherd Kings. Yes, many, many of the supposed, what are we going to call them, the enlightened ones, are supposed to be shepherds of their flock. They tend their flock fatten them up and then you know what they do to that flock they eat them so you have a choice between that kind of God or another kind of God who's still going to eat you we had February 14th um, uh, the Olympic skeleton racer crashed but what was interesting is the image on his helmet Skeleton, of course, symbolic with death. Is that a cool thing to put on your helmet? I would think, generally, um, why do something that is going to bring evil spirits to you? I know not everybody believes that kind of stuff, but... Uh, so he had an elk god, a stag, the god Cernan. Cernanos? Okay, Cernanos. Sorry, I had it spelled wrong. So he's flying down there. If we look at Revel um, 13, 3 Revelations, we're being told that after a head wound, Barak will be cursed. 
you will become possessed and be resurrected acting as a doorway for the horned god Satan. We've talked about before the transformations of I don't want to call them mythical but figures like Moses. The earliest pictures of Moses and representations of him he had no horns. There is a story that um, when he became enlightened he grew the horns. So I think it's a sign of possession. So two 1614, the date, Mac Miller released a video called Avion. Again, he's standing there with a nice upside-down cross. When I covered, he's got an upside-down cross in his hand because I covered. Symbolism, pretty easy. 666, 216, again the same day, um, released this day. To represent Satan, I guess. The numbers. You just times them. That's what they add up to. So I guess this is supposed to be clever. The word avion means feathered, airborne, characteristic of birds and flight. Remember, the Pope released the doves that were attacked as a reference to Noah and the fallen ones. It's, again, you know, looking at the winged serpents or beings or Nephilim or angels. In this Mac Miller song, it mentions psychics not being able to tell the future anymore. It just says lyrics like psychic don't know the future. And Argar is one who tells the future by watching the flight of birds. False prophet Pope Francis was in Argar rated. That's how they throw that word there last year. That's of course mentioned in a rap song, which I think is odd in the guys walking around a pyramid. Aramin, all of these cardinals like I need a Pope puffing the white smoke. Yeah, it's not poetic, but realize he didn't write this stuff. And the white smoke is what uh, comes off to tell us that um, the jinn has been released and the Pope has been possessed. No, that, that's not what I'm supposed to say, but I think that's what it means. Interestingly enough, last year's Super Bowl indicated San Francisco is that not symbolic of Pope St. Francis and the ravens, one of the birds which attacked the doves, he released. We're taking a little break, everyone. And uh, you're listening to Turtle Island News with Trace Kennedy. And we will be right back. Welcome back, everyone. You're listening to Turtle Island News with Tracy Kennedy. A couple of interesting questions in the room. People have asked if... Um, Obama has a scar. Yes, he does. He has a huge scar. Um, it looked like they took out a brain tumor, but it's humongous. Do I think that's what it is? Not yet. But this um, possession thing with so many news articles and things that we've been shown, all the bloodletting that's gone from you know, the bankers who are jumping out of windows that, guess what, um, don't open. So that's quite a friggin' trick. We're in the um, human sacrifice season, not that that's ever stopped on this planet. They're just saying that that's what they're going to do. Look at, again, all of the news and a couple days ago, I, I think um, Monday's articles just talked about Japan preparing for war, China preparing for war, Russia preparing for war. And these are the words they use. The war has never stopped here. It's the same war. And even all the genetic modifications that they're doing, 
they're using a physical thing to do something that should be spiritual. Do you know what I mean? Now again, San Francisco. I didn't get that because I had never heard of this guy before, but it's pretty much saying that this guy would would call himself St. Francis or model himself after Francis one way or another. They shout out, these signs and symbols would be right there, that Mac Miller also tells all of his listeners, and something's supposed to be for kids, well not kids, but younger people, he tells his listeners that they have no souls, that they are empty. This is another thing they want us to believe. They want us emptied and open. That's why everything is so sexual and why there's such that flat rate on TV to open us. Molecules are groups of atoms held together. Atoms. Isotopes are variations of chemical elements consisting of atoms, and an atom is a basic unit of matter. Mac Miller is denying that humans have an immaterial spirit or soul in his soul. They're looking at, at us like an atom, a group of atoms, a group of molecules, just a thing. He also mentioned something called Hamishantas, which too is odd for a rap song. He has a nice guru wearing red and wings. Again, a pyramid, avion, flashing lights. This guy is weird looking. Said, I'm done being here for y'all and all the prophets. Good. Get the hell off our planet. So this is again the ascended master, the fallen angel, the antichrist speaking a threat to believers and prophets. Don't believe it? Well, he comes out and says this. This guy, and I'm sure it's not just him, he's saying you auction off your father's watch from the Holocaust. So, you know, high five to the Jews there. Mention of Hamishtas is a reference to pastries, which symbolize the defeat of the enemy of the Jewish people. Of course, the chosen ones who are sacrificing the right amount of blood rituals to the God who is going to favor them. So it's going to open you up to allow these things in. When you pray to something, that's what you're doing. Hamantash also resemble a pyramid. Shape of a die cast kind of by Hammond in determining the day of destruction for the Jews. And they're eating it. And it's a nice sweet pastry, too. So here, eat of my flesh. The pyramid symbolizes the energy, the enemy. This specifically the Jews. But remember, Hebrews were held in bondage in Egypt, although they were not called that at that time. What we're seeing here, again, is just a reflection I'm going a lot into the Jews because they're kind of a big deal in this next part. So it's interesting enough that the Pyramid of Giza has a base of 230.38 meters in length and is 146.6 meters in height. The length, well twice the length of the base is divided by its height gives you the value of pi, 3.2. One four, and a huge series of never-ending numbers at the end of that. Apparently, this is the mystery of life, these numbers. Hamastash is usually eaten on Purim. This year, the date of Purim is 3, 15, 14, this year. One day after Pi Day, 3, 14. Pie, pie, get it? Mac Miller's video also pays homage to Satan, of course, shout out, and the Antichrist and the Fallen Angels. 
remember, all this Antichrist connection with Hinduism, Buddhism, Vedic tradition, talking about the exact same thing. I would say that all the Hebrew stuff is all Vedic, all Indian. This pyramid worship, this fallen angels, and this showing of a bunch of feathers. It connects also back to that Volkswagen commercial, 666, fallen angel from the Super Bowl. Because we may not quite get the message. So, you know, if you don't watch rap videos, they make sure that you get it with one thing or another thing. They want to make sure we all get it. A certain amount of um, cars are sold. An engineer grows its wings. The trip meter, and um, I want to remind you of that, read 419. This is the date, 419 which is the day before Hitler's birthday, the start of a 13-day satanic ritual to the sun, fire god, which accumulates May 1st, May Day. It's why there's so much death that happens on that day or just before. So, bringing these people up, these groups of people, these rituals, of course, doing it for a reason, as I usually do. This blessing or a curse, that's what we're being shown. Our blessing or a curse are a choice between two different kinds of demons. The winged ones, the ground ones, the 666, and the 419. Well, it was actually 999999 something it starts with. But it then shows it upside down just in case you didn't get. Now, April 29th this year, John Kerry and Barack's framework for the Agreement for Peace Treaty or Covenant is scheduled to be concluded. The odds of reaching that, everyone's saying, is incredible. So this is supposed to be a final Israeli-Palestinian peace deal that's supposed to be happening on that date. And um, the Israelis are still, of course, bombing and starving those people while we're watching. And it's all Ashkenazi Jews, which we'll go into, who have a little bit of Mongolian in them, as a matter of fact, the Mongols. But most people do. Most people have that. We've even seen old satanic movies that talk about this being, I think, Balrog's day, which kind of sounds like Barak. Interestingly enough, these things are thrown back in our faces. There's always stuff going on on those days. Oh, if you hear crashing and banging, that's my cat who would um, like to be paid attention to right now. Do you notice they only want to play at like inappropriate times or like four in the morning and on your feet? Or in your face. April 29th is supposed to be a big day for Satan. Why? I don't know. I'm sure they pick these days for a reason, but um, to me, it's ridiculous, all of it. It's a, oh, it's Baltane or um, Walpurgis, Walpurgis night. So it's filled with bonfires, um, orgies of course, consumption of hallucinogens, um, alcohol. Participants are then possessed by demons. They engage in sexual intercourse with the demons in male or female form. Drinking, doing drugs, these things specifically are meant to open you so that you will be a vessel for whatever it is you're worshipping. And what you worship has a lot to do with what what you believe in. If you remember, this Noah's flood was supposed to have started because of some sexual misconduct of fallen angels and humans. But the words they use are more, they came down and had strange flesh, that's used once, or they found us comely. They didn't love us. Again, there's no mention of the angels loving us. 
they wanted us. They wanted us. So the peace negotiations are scheduled to reach a conclusion on the Grand Witch's Sabbath, on the day of debauchery, basically. Also, April 29, 2011, in case you forgot, Osama bin Laden was killed. Obama made the announcement on May 1st, May Day. And he's standing there all, you know, proud. So it was human sacrifice on Baltain, basically. And the way he was sacrificed, the way he was laid to rest was really weird. So coming back to this year, February 12th, a news report services that declared Admiral William Mac Raven sent an email stating that the photos of of Osama bin Laden's um, dead body were destroyed. That they don't actually have any photos of this incident. We just have to take their word for it, I guess. 9-11, Osama bin Laden had been connected this year to at the Grammys because they throw all this stuff in our faces, of course, over and over again. It was connected kind of subtly because Macklemore, who won, had sent, um, I think it was, I want to say Skype, but it wasn't, it was a tweet, Twitter, said 9-11, Bush knocked down the towers. So it's kind of connected that way, where they had to just throw that up immediately after, in case you didn't get those numbers, and his significance, and this little rainbow um, thing he was doing, in case the rainbow. 9-11 is also connected with the Super Bowl this year as well. So remember, remember that blood. Um, one of the young men was sitting and announcing and saying, you know, how happy he was. And some guy ran up, grabbed the microphone and said, 9-11 was an inside job. He was immediately taken away, but it was odd that someone was just able to run past the security and do it. 9-11 was an event specifically meant to alter or tune consciousness of the masses, to bring them into harmony, to set them on a course to accept this new savior. Remember, the World Trade Center was designed specifically as a tuning fork, a sound representing C, middle C, as a matter of fact. This was broken for a reason. This was done for a reason. It's to show us what's going on. And the building that replaced the Twin Towers is called One World Trade Center. So it is now the new Tower of Babel, right in front of our face. Like, this is just all cool. Remember, remember, remember these times. Neither can we forget the fact that Obama signed the final beam that went into the One World Trade Center with a message in red of rebellion and defiance to one of the gods. Now remember, they're just playing one god against the other. He um, reversed the Genesis 11.9, basically. The destruction of the Tower of Babel. The scattering of the people from being under one world power. Yeah, 11.9 was when um, Tower of Babel was written about. I hadn't thought, I hadn't seen that too, but I went into it because I wanted to talk about um, the heritage of the Jews here, which they don't really have one other than Europeans and, and Mongolians. He signed it, of course, Obama, in a nice red flowing pen. We remember we build, we come back stronger, stronger, Obama. More important, we cannot forget the declaration made by Obama declaring himself God. He did. On September 11th, at ground zero, O, O for Obama. I'm going to try to play that for you. Because um, I 
played it for someone else. And they said, no, he didn't say that. I said, well, he kind of said that. So I'm going to play that for you right now. Hope you hear it. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Now, is that cool to you? Do you remember him saying that? If you take a look at the recent child sacrifice, because there was another one, another slaying of a young black teen teenager in Florida, which again echoes the Trevin Martin's sacrifice case. And of course, Skittles was brought up again, Taste the Rainbow. His name was Jordan Davis. He was murdered in cold blood by a man named Michael Dunn while sitting in a red SUV in a parking lot listening to some music with his friends. Now, was this man sentenced for that? He was not. His executioner, this Michael Dunn, was not convicted of Jordan's murder. He was, however, convicted of attempted murder for the other teens that he failed to murder that were present in the car. How does, how does that happen? How does that happen? I don't get it. I really don't. So how can it be, guys? So taking just a deeper look at this for a moment. Michael Dunn, the name. Michael, who is like God, Dunn, dark, brown. Jordan, from Yared, means to descend, fallen in shoal. Hell. Davis is from David, beloved, also from Dawidum, Dawidum, leader. These words being said, I will put them together, put them into a nice little handy sentence for you, just to show you this being thrown in our faces. The message declares, who is like God, the dark one with brown skin, who fell from heaven into Sheol, hell, the beloved leader. Obvious, ridiculous, in our faces again and again and again, this foolishness. Who is the dark, evil one with brown skin and beloved leader? Well, people either love this guy or hate him. Is it him? Are they saying it's him? Now remember, in order for him to be the new version of the Antichrist, he will have to die from a head wound and be resurrected. Remember, it's been declared, I saw Satan fall like lightning, which is Barak, from is O, heaven is Bama. Lightning from heaven, Barak Obama. We don't even get into the Hussein, we've done that before, guys, but I think you're, you're getting where I'm going with this. And the young Jordan was wearing a cap that said, Obey on it. This was the one picture that they showed up after he had passed away. I had showed you this Obey logo too. is a picture of Andre the Giant. Again, a reference to fallen angels, Nephilim, the winged gods. So we're giving a choice between the winged gods and the other ones, neither of which are any good for us. They certainly don't love us. They want us. Remember the Obey Giant designer too? Is the same man that produced the first Obama's Hope posters? Barack, blessing or curse? I'll let you decide. But it's in our faces, these things. Very, very much so. Over and over and over again. These themes. These things. These demigods and fallen angels and ridiculousness. Thrown in their faces again and again and again to make us remember what? 
to make us remember things that we have been told over and over and over again. The Khazars flourished from the 7th to the 11th century. This means that they emerged following the reign of the Emperor Justin. Issues surrounding the reign of Justinian recorded by um, Canopus indicated that something very strange was going on during that period in history. In 1998, us in the future basically made a comment about this and, and that was um, a writing by a, an author who remained anonymous but it was some of the stuff that I used to read but I can't find it anymore. A year later, 1999, the Knight Rider Washington Bureau published an article entitled Comets May Have Caused the World's Great Empires to Fall, which I've said before. Now, let me just remind you, recent scientific discoveries are shedding new light on why great empires such as Egypt, Babylon, Rome fell, giving way to periodic dark ages that punctuate human history. At least five times during the last 6,000 years, major environmental calamities undermined civilizations around the world. Researchers say these disappearances occur to be linked with comets, fragments of comets, such as one that broke up and smashed um, into Jupiter. The, what, I think 1985? So the impacts yielding many megatons of explosive energy um, produced loud, um, vast clouds of smoke and dust that circulated the globe for years, dimming the sun, driving down temperatures, um, showing hunger, disease, and death. Such global crises have had occurred in A.D. 530 and 540, beginning of Dark Ages in Europe. The Earth was pummeled by a swarm of cosmic debris. In every ancient book that I've ever read or read to you, we get comets, famine, wars, all around the same time. And we can actually put this into the 11 year solar cycle, which physically changes us. What happens usually after that is some new god comes in probably by the cosmic energies, because it won't be just our sun flaring, that comes, declares himself the new king or the new god, or they see cherubim or globes, or now UFOs in the sky. I read you writings from 6th century and 100th century old things that talk about the sun becoming dark hours without sun, animals behaving weirdly or attacking, no shadows at their bodies at noon, summer with no heat, these kind of things have pretty much been established by analysis of tree rings, that we've had problems in northern Europe, Siberia, western North Africa, southern South Africa, that happened at the exact same time. Celtic myths, myths all over the world talk about lightning bolts in the sky and the arrival of something. Many different names of this, of course, but they call it the arrival. This goes throughout history. Now, the kingdom of the Khazars has vanished from the map of the world today. Many other people have never even heard of it, but the Khazar kingdom, Khazarian, was a major power. Byzantine Emperor and historian Constantine recorded a treaty made to these people, have messages of the King of the Khazars, required a seal worth um, three solidity, I don't know, soldiers, um, funny they use that word, eh? So it's money. Pretty clearly understood that the Khazars were powerful and even more powerful than the emperor of the East or Rome at the time. 
It wasn't flattery, but it was really happening. How can it be taught that the Byzantine Empire and the rise and the power of the popes of Western Empire and have so little knowledge of an empire that existed at the same time, that was obviously more powerful than either of them, that was Jewish empire because they did that politically. It was a political choice that had nothing to do with them being related to anybody. Now the country of the Khazars was strategically located at the gateway between Black Sea and the Caspian. So it kind of acted as a buffer protecting Byzantium against invaders by the barbarian Bulgars, um, all kinds of them, later Vikings and later Russians. More important, though, is the fact that the Khazars also blocked the Arabs from Eastern Europe. Within years of the death of Muhammad, the armies came sweeping northward towards the wreckage of two empires and carrying all before them reached the great mountains of the Caucasus. This barrier once passed, the road laid open to the lands of Eastern Europe. As it was on the lines of the Caucasus, the Arabs met forces of an organized military power which effectively pre prevented them from going forth. The wars of the Arabs and the Khazars, which lasted for more than a hundred years, aren't talked about much. Most people know that the Frankish army turned back Arabs in the field of Tours, it was called. Few people know that at the same time the Muslims were met and held by forces of Khazar. The future and Emperor Constantine married a Khazarian princess. Their son became Emperor Leo IV, known as Leo the Khazars. So, later. Well, actually, I'll tell you when. A few years later, and this is debated, but probably around 740 AD, the king of the Khazars and his court and the military ruling class embraced Jewish faith and Judaism because the state, it became the state religion of the Khazars. It was not before that, even though this empire was much older. This came as a reaction against the political pressure of the other two superpowers of the day, Byzantium and the Muslims, of which the advantage of monotheistic state-ruled religion which allowed them greater control over their subjects, not wanting to be subject to either a pope or the Byzantine emperor, but seeing the political benefits of religious controls, Judaism was chosen. It was strategic. It was a well-made plan. The peak of the power, the Khazars controlled or received tribute from 30 or more different nations and tribes spread across territories between Caucasus, um, Ural Mountains, town of Kiev, Ukrainian steppes. These people included Bulgars, um, Gizaras, Gothic, Greek colonies of Crimea, Slavic tribes northwest. Until the 9th century, the Khazars had no rival to their supremacy in the regions of the North Black Sea. The adjacent steppe in the forest regions were theirs. Khazars were the supreme master of the southern half of Europe, Eastern Europe, for a century and a half. During this period, they held back the onslaught of nomadic tribes from the east. So at the timeline of history, Khazarian Empire existed between the Huns and the Mongols, basically. The Arab chronicers wrote the Khazars were white, their eyes blue, their hair flowing, predominantly reddish, their bodies large, their natures cold, their general aspect wild. Now Georgians and Armenians have been repeatedly devastated by the Khazarians, identified them years ago as the Gog and Magog. An Armenian writer described them as having broad um, lashness of face, long flowing hair like women. So they don't sound like long haired Franks. But they kind of sound like long haired Franks. They sound more north 
than anything that came up from the South. Now, there was an embassy sent to Attila at the same time. Included a fame, some, um, an early geneticist, I guess. He's just kind of finding where people came from. He kept a minute account, not only of the diplomatic negotiations, but court intrigue goings on in Attila's sumptuous banquet halls. He was, in fact, a perfect gossip columnist, basically, one of the first writers. is still one of the main sources of, of all information on the Huns and their habits. But he also writes anecdotes to tell about a people subject to the Huns that, that he calls the Atsartes, so ak -ar, or white Khazar. So this is um, about two, no, let me think, 300 years before they became Jewish. They were white Khazars. That's what they called them. Now this warrior race, and that's what they were, usually sided with the Hans, but they were subject to them and wrote over and over again that Attila must be pleased. So after the collapse of the Hun empires, the Khazars raided and absorbed numerous other nomadic hordes, tribes. At this point, the Western Turkish Kingdom started. Confederation of the Tribes of Kagan. The Khazars later adopted this title for their rulers as well. So this Turkish state fell apart after a century. But it's important to note that it was only after a period in which the word Turkish was used in reference to a specific nation, because it hadn't been used before, as opposed to its earlier use, which simply meant a tribe speaking a Turkic language that were the Khazars and the Bulgars. They spoke Turk, still do. So, the time of these comments that brought about the Dark Ages. The Khazars rose to power. There's all kinds of pictures of sightings of angels, demons, things coming from the sky. Strange sicknesses that were described as possessions almost. So, superpowers at the time, two of whom had been fighting each other for over a century, just collapsed suddenly. Persians defeated. Arab armies um, delivered some kind of coup de grace. So in short order, Muslims conquered Persia, Syria, Mesopotamia, Egypt, surrounded the Byzantine Empire in a half circle from the Mediterranean to the Caucasus. Muslims repeatedly penetrated Khazaria in an attempt to have this foothold in Eastern Europe. Meanwhile, the Khazars consolidated their own power, expanding into the Ukraine, a gigantic Islamic pincer movement across the West, across the Caucasus, to the Eastern Europe, was halted at both ends at the same time by these guys, the Khazars, who were working with the Gauls and all of Western Europe, I guess. So at the end, there was a marriage. Khazar princess to the heir of the Byzantine emperor. Gratitude for the defeat of the Muslims. Overnight, an entire group of people, the warlike, fanatical Khazars, suddenly proclaimed themselves Jews. Just like that. Khazarian kingdom began to be described as the kingdom of the Jews. Succeeding Khazars, rulers took Jewish names, sent Jewish scholars from Spain to come and instruct them, settle them. Ninth century, the Khazar kingdom became a haven for Jews of other lands. But it seems this process was almost exclusively a question of male Jews coming and marrying Khazar women. What does not seem to have happened is the intermarriage of Khazars with Jewish women from other Jewish communities. So, these things happened. They weren't Jewish. They're certainly not Semitic at all. In short, Khazaria was an extremely prosperous country. 
depended on military power alone. Beginning at the 9th century, they had more or less a tactic, non-aggressive pact with several other um, tribes at the time, Byzantium. So they got together to fight the Vikings. Two centuries earlier, it had been the Arabs and that holy war. No, it was the Vikings and another war. So war and famine and satellites, asteroids, comets, return of the god, the end of the world, this keeps coming up. That's what I mean. Now we've talked in a bunch about their history again. How they moved, how they changed. They became they became the Jews. They were mentioned before. These are the secret controllers who are not Jewish, never have been. The turn of the century bankers, merchants, industrialists, artists, intellectuals thronged the broad boulevards that rang around Budapest, Hungary. They rode them in Europe's first subway. 1890, 900, population of Budapest was increased more than 40%. And they were talked about that Hungary's economy, intellectual flowering began, which established some sort of dual monarchy with Austria. Under an agreement, Hungary achieved something approaching independence from Austria. These things, this dual nobility, it's still the two sides. Then there was a new growing anti-Semitism because um, the Jews were backing both sides, as they still do. These new Jews, now remember, this was up north, and these are people without any links, really, to any Jews. The analysis of this Jewish civilization, if they have much of anything, they are more Han and European, but most of them were blonde. They've been spoken of. They've been brought forth like they're a big deal. Jewish states, when they first came, well, they called it a Jewish state, but remember it was created. Names always deceive, you know. When studying the general patterns of words, you must always remember that the real names, the ethnic names, and the name used is not the same. We often encounter different words bearing one and the same name. The word Romans, Romani, for instance, originally met a citizen of Polis Rome, but not all the Italics and not even the Latins who inhabited lands of other places. The Roman Empire, when it was at its top, first, second centuries, a number of Romans increased, including among them many different lands, inhabitants of provinces, and they were in no means Latin in, in origin. The Gauls were brought in, all kinds of other things. Inhabitants of municipalities, territories, Roman Empire were all called Romans, but they were Greek, they were Jews, they were Berbers, they were Gauls, they were um, Germanic. The concept Roman is not an ethnic meaning. It never was. It was simply just changed and used. This general element became unity, not even of culture, but historical fate instead of origin and language. Ethnos existed in that form for three centuries. Considerable period did not break up. They just lumped everybody in there. This new ethnos is formed on a basis called Byzantine. And they started Romanic, Romans. Most of them spoke Greek. A large number of Slavs, Armenians, Syrians, also merged with Roman. They retained the name Romans until 1453, till the fall of Constantinople. Romanic considered previously themselves Roman, but not 
the population of Italy. Then there were the Syrian Semites who settled in Italy, which had become deserted basically because of all the war. The townspeople and the former people that were in prisons, prisons of war basically, became warrior peoples and peoples of any time conquered by the Romans of the empire. They became peasants. They called themselves Roman or Italian. Florentines, Genoese, um, Venusians, not from Venus, but from Venice. Inhabitants of Italy considered themselves now Romans, not Greeks. And on the grounds claimed priority of Rome, where only ruins remained of the city. This is how things change. Romans arose from the Danube, which had been a place of exile after Roman conquest. There were many different people, Syrians, Greeks, Iberians. In short, the eastern subjects of the Roman Empire served sentences for rebellion against Roman rule. But they all became Romanian, Roman. These words just jumped around. So if you treat this kind of continuing thing, the Romans of an age of a republic and the Roman citizens of a late empire. You can see how things gradually change in different names. It's just examples of camouflage. So in the 6th century AD, small people living on the eastern slopes of the mountains were called Turks of the Caucasus Mountains. Several successive wars, they began to, they managed to subjugate a whole steppe. The subjects of the great, well, the Khazars, preserved their own different names for stuff, began calling to be called Turks, or the Turkish Khan. And Khan is a word I just love. So, this moves on. Later, scholars from the area almost seem to forget. Now, since this scientific term, and let me talk about the Turks here for a minute. The original bearer of this name, Tartar, Tartar is Eastern European word, was Mongol. It became known with a population. Um, it's called, they were loyal to the Khan of the Golden Horde. They called themselves Tartars. The original bearer of this name was Karaites, Namanites, Oronites, Tartars but they began to call themselves Mongol. The names thus changed places, kind of switched over. Now since a time scientific terminology arose, which Tartar type became called Mongoloid, the language there changed a little bit. In other words, we even employ an obvious camouflage terminology in science. But it, it's not simply a matter of confusion here. Not all the nomad subjects of the Golden Horde were loyal. The rebels lived in the steppes. They began to call themselves other things. Irish, because of their remoteness. They became the ancestors of the Khazars. But first they were Mongols. The ancestors of all these people who survived these greater ba battles, the Tartars included Kama, Burgers, Khazars, Barastis. But they were pretty fair-skinned, light-haired people, and for the majority of their, before they started to mix with some Jews that they allowed up, they were um, northern. But it's not done yet. At the end of the 15th century, Russians, banned from Upper Volga, began to attack these grounds, force the population to leave their homeland, go to Central Asia under chieftainship of someone else, another Khan, 1500s. So they were met with energy forces because the local Turks, which could have been a whole bunch of people, more bore another name. Now after, they were called after Genghis Khan's second son, who ruled a lot. Members of this horde quit their homeland, went under another name, Uzbek, Uzbekistan, that started later, Berbers, if you want to call them that. So the Turks 
remained farther north. They changed their name to Uzbekistan. The same Turks who went to India began calling themselves Mongols in memory of their 300 year earlier Mongol Empire. So a genuine, the met genuine Mongols who settled in eastern Iran, 13th century, even retained their name. They're still called um, Khazarian, Khazrati, from a Persian word, Khazar, which meant a thousand. It was a military group or a division. But where are the Mongols? By whose name the yoke was laid? They are not an ethnos, because Genghis Khan and his will, basically, said that 4,000 warriors of the Joki, the Batu, Ordu, and Sheshabini all received 4,000 warriors. Only part came from the Far East. They were called Kins and not Tartars from the Chinese name. This rare name occurred at the last time, I think, well, a long, long time ago anyway. So, basically, this yoke was not Mongol at all, but enforced by the ancestors of nomad Yerzbeks. I know it gets pretty complicated. So these names switch around is what I'm saying. With this strange history where they're just jumping around, the relationship of these people, I think, begins to make sense. Offhand remark that describes Kassarians sound like a lot like the descriptions of flanks. Our medium writer described them as broad, lashless faces. So not a lot of hair, long flowing hair like a woman. The fact is nobody really knows who the Franks were or where they even came from. It's been conjectured that they are some barbarian tribe from the east. The idea is that they are Frisians, maybe. They still don't know. But comings and goings of a whole bunch of people um, walked around. We will go further into this. So my point is, our story has been lied about. We have no idea who these people are, and they're certainly not Arabs.